morning, Green Spring. Today is Friday, April 12th, and I welcome you to Village in Motion. We hope we have an interesting program for you. My guest in the studio is Ed Linz today. He is an organ recipient of many years, and I was asked to do this show because I'm an organ donor. So hopefully we'll get into an interesting conversation. I Good morning, so. Ed. Well, hi. Thank you, Alka. Appreciate your asking me to be here today. Sure, and I understand you have quite a history already as an organ recipient. How long well, ago did that happen? Well, I received a heart oh, uh, wow. at Fairfax and Nova Hospital on the 9th of uh, September in 1994. So this year will be our 25th wow. anniversary. Yes. And I say our because it's really a family th thing in the sense that uh, I certainly would not have been able to make it through the ordeal that I had without the support of my family and friends. Uh, because and was I was at the ordeal before? The, the ordeal before operation? and after, and after. Uh -huh. uh, as you well know, uh, the, the waiting list uh, to receive an organ continues to grow because of right. the shortage we have of donors. And, and one of the things we certainly hope uh, today is, is that uh, those listening will not only consider for themselves, but for their uh, family members and friends to uh, become, sign up at least, to become potential donors. Right, right. Uh, because, I mean, you well know because you were a donor That's yourself. True. That's right. How long ago I, was that for you? That was 18 years ago. Oh, my God. Yeah, 2001. I didn't really intend to be a donor. I mean, it's not like it was a long uh, plan that I had worked on and thought about. It came about in an interesting way, unexpected to me. I, I, I had a small business at the time, and I don't know what you did when you were working. When you have a small business, you have to constantly market yourself. Of course. And so I was part of various networking groups, and I met a woman who had her own small business, and that was... Um, massage and Reiki and sacrocranial something or other and you know we got along we chatted uh, and then she told me that she was in need of a kidney donor because she had already been on dialysis for five six years and which is very difficult yes it's yeah it's difficult. a long waiting list it's a very difficult thing yeah particularly for kidneys right and very you long. get weaker and weaker yes. over the years and so I heard that, okay, I went home. And then what happened, what I think of now, is the spiritual element mm -hmm. that I had never considered before. And that is that I heard this small voice, you know, they talk about the small, still voice of God. They kept coming to me and saying, well, why don't you donate? And I poo-pooed it for a while and pushed it aside. I had always focused on being healthy and taking care of myself. Now, why would I subject myself to a, a difficult and long operation and be in the hospital if I didn't need to? It's certainly no free lunch to do this. No, it's not. Yes. And after a while, though, that voice kept coming back. And after a while, I thought, well, I guess I have to learn about it at least. Yes. You know, maybe just to have better ammunition to, to say no. But the more I learned, and um, the woman who ended up being my, my recipient uh, was in a trial at uh, NIH, and you get exceedingly good care there, I found out. The, now, where, let me interrupt for a second. Where did you re uh, actually receive the operation that removed? In, at NIH. At NIH. In Bethesda. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes, and uh, so once I learned that you can live very well with one kidney. And you seem to be doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have. I most of the time I don't yeah. think about it. Right, you right. Know, they, they, they told me I probably shouldn't play rugby and probably shouldn't ride a motorbike. Well, you know, those two things were easy to avoid in my life. I've never. I picture you as a rugby it. player. <laughs> Just because you know I'm German, I know. <laughs> right. No, but so um, so I went into that process with some hesitation and a lot of learning. And of course, a lot of checkups. I mean, you know how many how many exams you go through. Right. Uh, probably at both ends, right? Oh yes. And then, did you meet your donor? Well, uh, oh, probably of not. Of course because not, because with a heart, deceased. it's different. You yes, have to, and yes, and yes. and uh, I 
a uh, little background on my situation. Uh, I uh, was in perfect health and I went for a physical in 1991 and all of a sudden halfway during the physical the mood of my uh, physician suddenly changed. And I said, what's wrong Robin? And she said, well the T wave on your echocardiogram is inverted. And I said, so what? What does that mean? I just, that's exactly. I, so I said, I just ran a marathon. I feel great. Really? And uh, How old were you at the time? Uh, well, it was about four. I, when I was diagnosed, I was like 47. Okay. Something like that. So what was 40, this diagnosis? Well, the di anyway, English? there was no diagnosis. She just said uh, the T-wave was inverted. I said, so what? Uh, so she said, well, you need to see a cardiologist. And I said, yeah, right, you know. So I went home, but she called up my wife, who was a nurse, ah. and uh, Got who some was also one of her patients. And, and so between the two of them, they twisted my arm. I saw a cardiologist, went through a series of tests. Everything was pretty much normal. Finally, they kept doing more and more invasive tests, including one where they uh, go up through your groin and do a heart catheterization, yeah. and uh, which I assume several of the folks here have, have probably gone through or know people that gone through. Right. And anyway, uh, almost as an afterthought, they took five tissue samples out of my heart. And three, a couple of weeks later, they called me back and said, we need to see you and your wife. Uh, the doctor called me in. I remember it like it was yesterday. We we're sitting in, at his office and he says, you have cardiac sarcoidosis. We don't know what causes it. There's no known cure and it's fatal. And, and he what gave does me, it mean? That's the name of the disease, yeah. cardiac sarcoidosis. He said, you have, you have two years to live. I said, two, I'm in perfect health. Yeah. Well, it turns out that this disease causes, it's normally in people's lungs. It normally affects black women in the South. I looked in the mirror and said, what have my parents not told me? Mm -hmm. So uh, at any rate, that what it does, this, and when it's in your heart, it causes the electrical signal from the top of the heart uh -huh. to have trouble reaching the bottom of the heart. And so auxiliary panels, auxiliary paths are set up, and it causes the heart to uh, go into rapid beating, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And so. And uh, can't find its regular rhythm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so okay. I, uh, start, I started developing the symptoms about three months later. Uh, and then oh. I ended up uh, having tests done to try to do antiarrhythmic drugs on me. This was all over at Fairfax and Nova Hospital. None of them worked. Uh, one even made me worse, uh, the lidocaine. Uh, but and they when did you, find. When you, sorry, when you said the symptoms started three months later, what were they? The uh, rapid heartbeat. Where, oh, so then you could feel it. Yes. And, and also, by that time, I was carrying uh, a box with me such that if I felt this rhythm, I should put it over my heart and hit it, literally hit like a tape recorder with a record button. Remember, we're talking back yes. in the 1990s. Yeah, yeah. And then you, then when it's over, then you literally call an 800 number in New York. And the guy answers the phone. I say, I think I got a problem. He says, well, uh, put the phone, or put your, the phone up oh, next really? to the Oh, really? Yeah. And, and then he said, uh, yeah, you need to talk to your doctor. So at any rate, uh, that's what the symptoms were. And uh, so this happened the first time when it was out, of, uh, high, out in the Grand Canyon. Uh, but at any rate, uh, they, uh, I ended up the following February, that was in 94, the following February, I was playing racquetball up at South Run. And uh, I, I was on a drug called amiodarone, which, is a, which was given to me. It was the only drug which worked, but it had bad side effects, real bad side effects. Uh, at any rate, uh, I was playing racquetball and I went into an arrhythmia and I almost died. I was 911 to the hospital. Whoa. Almost died on my way to the hospital. And uh, consequently- Pretty scary, huh? Well, yeah, because the, uh, on the way to the hospital, I'm, I'm conscious. Yeah. And the EMT in the vehicle says, he's getting worse, what should we do? He's talking to over oh the radio, to, yeah. and I'm listening to this. Yeah. And the doctor in the hospital says, push 500 units of lidocaine. I said, don't do that. That makes me worse. That's one of the drugs that makes me worse. They pushed it. So then as we're on the beltway now, he says, he's really worse now, what should we do? And there's a pause and the doctor says, push another 500 units of lidocaine, I started to cry. 
I said, you're going to kill me before I get to the ER. Well, the time I got to the ER, it was a cold February evening. The only reason I'm alive is my physician that was called an electrophysiologist, a certain type of cardiologist, happened to be there. And uh, he saved me. So then they said, well, the only thing you need, you, the only the medicine obviously doesn't work all the time. I said, yeah. And, uh, Told you. Yeah. So uh, they in, did a, a surgery, which at that time was huge. It was open heart surgery, where they put a box in me. I should have brought it today. It was about two pounds down in my abdomen, which is called an internal cardiac defibrillator. You've seen the things where they put the paddles on Boom. people. Boom. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. this was inside me. Really? I had paddles literally sewn onto the sides of my heart. Ooh, and I've this never computer heard down here, about it. this computer down here would sense that. Some of the people here at Green Springs have these now because they're the size of a pacemaker. Okay. At that time, we're talking 25 years ago, yeah. actually more than 25 years ago. Anyway, I lived with that for two years, but I, by that time, by 94, the spring of 94, the disease had progressed where I couldn't walk from here uh, to the front desk. And uh, they said, well, the only thing that could possibly save you was a transplant. And so I went through what you were just talking about, where all these different tests to ensure that there were other things, issues involved with me. Then a big committee meets to decide right. whether you know, you're a good candidate, including even a psychiatrist that talks. Exactly, to you, sort of yes. Thing. Well, anyway, they decided, but the problem was, and, and uh, this is why we're here today, uh, there are no hearts available. And uh, you don't just take one of these off a shelf. And so... Uh, yeah, I mean, different from my case. You know, yes, I, as yeah, you can see, I live very well with one kidney. Right, right. I don't think I would be here without a heart. Well, no. I mean, and, and the problem is, is that whereas a kidney can be preserved for up to almost 48 hours outside the body, a heart will only last four hours or so. Okay. So when the person is deceased and they have to be brain dead, uh, that you can't just like die. You have to be brain dead for this to take place, uh, and so. And they, then they, it has to happen they, now. Exactly. And and this young woman who was my donor, and uh, I'll talk about her in a moment. Uh, she had been in perfect health, 33 years old, perfect oh. health. She went to bed and had a brain aneurysm. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and mm -hmm. she passed away. Oh, she was brain dead. So they tried for a couple of days to make, make sure that there was nothing they could do to help her, and there yeah. wasn't. So finally, her, fortunately, her family uh, said, well, let's donate her organs. Yes. And so Thank I, I, I have, I, uh, her name was Monica, and, uh, which I subsequently learned later. And anyway, now I'm a big hiker. Uh, you might say, well, why are you wearing this shirt? Well, I just looks came. Looks African to me. It I is. I was in Thank Kenya you. a while ago. Uh, well, yeah. uh, it's from Tanzania. Oh, well, right next and, door. And I was just in Tanzania hiking Mount Kilimanjaro. Really? In January. I, now, I did not make it to the top because I ended up with altitude sickness, but mm -hmm. everything was fine. But when I hike, I always hike with Monica. Uh, my, uh, that's my donor. Your donor. She's a beautiful woman. And, uh, but wherever I go, Monica literally goes with me both inside me and when I'm hiking on yes. my backpack. Yeah. Because I'm forever grateful. Yeah, you of can course. Imagine, of course. To this family. Uh, now, the, have, I have you a met question. the family? I have, as a matter of fact. Not initially. Initially, you know, you write a letter and saying thank you. Yeah. And to the family of my donor. Yes. And so there's this. So and that at that point, did you already know who they no, were? No. no that goes no, through the no. hospital, you go, right? You go through the transplant organization, the Washington Regional Transplant Community is the name of the outfit now, WRTC, mm -hmm. and that organized this matchmaking. And uh, so I got a letter back from them, but all, they black off, black out all your names. So we went through this blind dating process for, <laughs> for a while. And then finally, a year and a half later, this family said, we would like to meet uh, our donor family. So it was a very emotional. As a matter of fact, it occurred during April, during which is the National, National Organ and or Tissue Donation no, Month. Exactly. Yeah. They have a yeah. meeting over. Wow, that was great that they had yeah. that awareness. They wasn't have it? that each year over at the National Presbyterian uh, church over in Washington, D.C., uh -huh. and uh, my donor family 
was in one room oh. and we were in the other room yeah and then they open the doors the door. wow. and you meet and oh. it was so emotional I uh, bet the uh, the mother was there and the her sis Monica's younger sister was there and uh, some other family members. The father was not there because the father was never on board with this. Oh. Very interesting. But Monica had indicated that she wanted to be a donor. Yeah. And so uh, the family made, fortunately for me and for my family, made the decision to do so. So we became friends. It was very interesting. Every time Monica's mother uh, would, we would be together because we would have dinner together uh, a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. They moved to Florida for a while, then they moved back up here. They live in McLean. And uh, whenever uh, she would, her name was Maria Christina, the mother, would, we would meet, she would say, Mr. Lenz, can I listen to Monica's heart? Yeah, I was Monica's just going heart? to And she ask would put about that. her ear on my chest yeah. to listen to mm. her daughter's heart. Wow. So I regard this as, as a precious commitment that I have yes. to not only their family, but to uh, the, the whole organ and tissue donation world to try to, so to speak, spread the gospel That's about, the same for about me. how transplantation works. It's a wonderful thing. It is allowed. I was teaching, you said you don't know much about me. I grew up in Kentucky, went to the Naval Academy, went into the Navy, spent 20 years in submarines, I had command of a nuclear submarine, retired in 1985, began teaching high school math and physics at Woodbridge High School. Uh -huh. After I was ill, I started writing. I became a writer for about five years. Uh, however, they had an opening over here where they desperately needed a physics teacher. And uh, I was coaching uh, track and cross country at West Springfield and the principal said, hey, we need you, can you come up? And I said, no way, I'm, I'm doing this other things. However, right before, they still didn't have anyone before school began, I said, I'll do it. So I said, I, I was planning to do it just for a year, go back to writing. And uh, uh, one of our, my colleagues died of lung cancer, a physics teacher. And uh, so I stayed until 2011. Mm -hmm. So I retired in 2011 and uh, now I write. And I, uh, I tutor, and yesterday, interestingly, I began teaching a class again, not with the school system, but with a group that helps uh, homeschoolers. Uh-huh, great. So, so you're pretty active. Now what yeah. I've read um, is when you get an organ, you have to keep taking medication. medication. Yes. Is that the same for you? So yes, that it your is. So body I, doesn't I reject, still, is that I, I still, uh, each day, take anti-rejection medication. Mm -hmm. However, Elka, it is very, very, very small doses. Has I that could, been reduced over yes, time? Yes, yes. It's, it's been your reduced. body kind of As getting used to As a matter of fact, well, yes and no. Uh, I am reluctant to totally go off the medication and my doctors are very reluctant for me to do so. I have pushed to reduce the medication yeah. because what happens is the medication makes you very susceptible to skin cancers. Mm. And so I have on my hands, I've had several places, this one just recently removed with Mohs surgery, which I'm sure some of our viewers oh, sure. have, have, have been familiar with. Uh, so I try to uh, have as little uh, medication as possible, but I take it every day. And well, there's a balance, you know, you have yeah, to have with other yeah, situations yeah. too, where you don't want these side effects, but you have to take there, that. Life is so, a trade-off, yeah, life is a trade-off. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. But what a great uh, trade-off you have, right? What yeah. a gift. Well, I'm very it, blessed. You know how you meet people in the hallways out here and they say, how are you doing today, Elka? And my response is always the same. I say, well, I woke up this morning. Yeah. And because everything else is a bonus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I honestly feel that way. This is why I, uh, it's why I hike with Monica, because when I'm hiking with Monica, uh, it becomes a conversation point. Yes. And I'll meet people yes. out on the trail, like I've hiked on uh, 
in each of the states on the Appalachian Trail. I've hiked the last 110 miles up in Maine. Mm -hmm. And each time I hike, I meet people and they say, who is that, is that your daughter? Yeah. And I said, no, that is me. Yeah. At least my heart due to this wonderful family that donated this beautiful woman's heart to me. So it's... Uh, I know what you mean with the conversation piece. I also had to figure out a way to talk about it because it's such an important issue, mm. but I didn't want to talk about it as a, oh, look what I did yeah. thing. So I found that difficult at the beginning, but my recipient asked me to put on my car around the license plate, you know, one of those frames yes, that yes. says kidney donor right, or something, something, right. miracle worker. And to this day, I have that on my car. Not, well, to, not to show off, but to yeah. make people, like you said, think, and hopefully some people who listen to us today start thinking whether they maybe should have organ donation on their driver's license, or at least talk to their family, or however the word keeps spreading. Well, I'm 75 now, and people listening might say, well, what can I donate? Well, there are several things you can donate in right. term a at our age, and that is basically you can donate skin tissue, eye, you can donate corneas and things such as this. But more importantly, you can also uh, spread the word, so right. to speak, and talk to folks and say, you know, I saw this TV show today with Elka and Ed, and they were talking about this, and uh, I think all of us in our family really ought to consider, consider this. And, and you know, and is is something to do. Right. Obviously, we hope we don't die. But yeah. if tragedy does occur, at least some good can come from it. That's right. And, and in your case, those co those conversations you have to have before. Exactly. That's why I have my heart because Monica That's had a right. conversation with her family. And the family was prepared to make a decision. And and I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. You did this so many years ago. Were you one of the first people or at that time uh, living donors were not really nearly as common as they are now? That's correct. I mean, yeah. uh, you must have been sort of not the first, obviously. No, but, not the first. But, 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 but at that time, this was really quite a brave thing to do because there was not a lot of history. You know, that's interesting you should say that. There was not a lot of history. No, yes. and they, uh, I was glad that I was in a trial because NIH learned not only about the donor, but yes. also things about the recipients of that course. they had no idea about before, yeah. and that they hadn't really never paid attention to. One of the doctors told me afterwards. Right. But anyway, you said that was a brave thing. That thought never occurred to me. Other really? people have called a brave. No, it just from the beginning it felt so right. Yeah, the right thing to do. It just, it just, yeah, it was I, I was not fearful. And uh, even after I had learned the details of the surgery and how long the recovery is, da 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 da, it was all pretty um, invasive. If you had um, any issues since the surgery? No. Wow. No. Wow. I have. Well, I shouldn't say no. Maybe, but I'm not even sure in the big picture how much of an issue it is. Uh, living donors tend to have a harder time with the kidney donors tend to have a harder time with weight regulation afterwards. Really? That's what NIH said they learned from mm -hmm. the group right. me and the others right. in that study. Right. Nobody knew that before and um, so you know I had to work on that a little more maybe than I would I don't know but it didn't well, really I mean considering that somebody else got to live longer, exactly. it wasn't a big deal, you know. Well now, I know that you're aware of this, but our, some of our viewers may not be, but there's also now, and this is a relatively recent development, in that uh, you can also uh, be a donor for part of your liver. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously you can't do anything for, for a heart, but in other words, there are living liver donors. Yes. And obviously there's, and you're aware of this, there's matching issues sure, in yeah. terms of making sure that your organ that you're donating is compatible with, you know, the recipient, that sort of thing. Yes. It's uh, a lot less stringent. The criteria are a lot less stringent from a living donor than yes. from a cadaver I learned yeah. at NIH. Very interesting. But, uh, yeah, they Very match you up. And, and like you said at the beginning, the waiting list is long. 
So they, is, they can match you if you Is, if you the, want is to your recipient still alive? No. What happened? No, she died of a different disease, oh. and that was incredibly painful. Oh, I and, can imagine. You know, I mean, she, you would she think had that two children. You would think who, that part of you passed away. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. And then for a while I thought that maybe somehow my willingness to donate a kidney resulted in or played a part in her, her heart gave out. And it was really difficult. For about a wow. year I had to deal with, with guilt that I didn't even really know how to express because it didn't really make much sense when it came out of my mouth, but a very clear and loud feeling on the inside. But then I, I, I looked back on the months that, different from you, my donor was alive, yes, of and course. Um, so we had um, we had a lot of conversations, and we really? meditated together. Sure, wow! And, and so that was such a valuable time, even you know, to remember, and for her children to remember, even after she had passed. Well, so in I my, had to come in, to yeah, that point. Right. In my case, uh, we, uh, as I said, had dinner uh, yeah. several times. Uh, generally twice a year uh, with our donor family. And in that case, my, my Monica's father passed away. That's why they moved back. They had moved to Florida. That's why uh, her mother moved back to up, up here. And uh, then her mother, Maria Christina, uh, passed away about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were at the funeral when, you know, I, she had been so sweet to me and as a matter of fact, we had done a, uh, what do you call it, PSA, public service announcement, announcement thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, uh, the, that appeared on several of the local TV stations. You uh, had that said we, that Monica had a younger sister. Are you still in contact with her? I am. Uh, her mm -hmm. name is Christina. The mother was oh, Maria Christina, yeah. and her name is Christina. She lives over in McLean, and a very sweet woman. What a beautiful uh, story. So, yeah, yeah. so we're can very, you, we've been can very you believe? Blessed. Our half hour is already up. We <laughs> talked about it. It's, um, we, I could go on and on. It's so interesting to have you here, Ed. Well, thank I you, thank Alka. thank you very much yes, for yes, coming in. Yes. I hope, Greenspring, you found this an interesting conversation, and you will keep the conversation alive by continuing to think about and talk about organ and tissue donation. <laughs>